Yeah. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, hopefully you've signed our guest book uh, so that we can stay in touch with you. Um, small logistics, there are restrooms downstairs. Um, there are flyers on the desk and in the thing that spins around about lots of other things uh, coming up. Um, next weekend there will be a program on Iran and the weekend after that uh, a program on uh, Gaza, showing a new film about uh, what's going on in Gaza. Very timely, given what uh, has just been announced by the president. So, um, we're delighted that you're here. I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Greg Pofro, uh, who's going to introduce Kathy. And then Marie, you're going to speak afterwards? Or? I'll speak for a couple minutes between the question and the Okay. So, Everybody hang on so you can hear Marie. <laughs> We're very glad you're here. Great. Thanks, Peter. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Kelly. Kathy Kelly has been a peace activist since the early 1980s, and I want to emphasize this day in and day out. From 1996 to 2003, she was a leader founder of Voices in the Wilderness, a campaign in the U.S. U.N sanctions against Iraq. Between 1996 and 2003, Voices organized over 70 delegations to Iraq, bringing food and medicine directly to Iraqi citizens. She has worked with peace teams in several countries, including dozens of trips to Iraq, notably remaining in combat zones during the early days of the U.S.-Iraq war. Since 2005, she has been one of the leading founders of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. She has continued her work for peace in the Middle East, including Afghanistan. Since 2000, she's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. In 2015, she was awarded the U.S. Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation for inspiring nonviolence and risking her own life and freedom for peace and victims of war. She is active with the Catholic Worker Movement, has taught in high schools and community colleges. She earned her B.A. from Loyola, and a master's in religious education from the Chicago Theological Seminary, where she was awarded an honorary doctorate of theology in 2005. Kathy's associates have commented on interviews on her heavy work and travel schedule, noting in one instant that jail is the only place she can rest. <laughs> Kathy was one of the first to protest with Father Roy Bourgeois, who founded the School of America's Watch. In November 2003, I was blessed to join her in a peaceful and prayerful protest at the School of the America's Watch Vigil at Fort Benning, where we were arrested for federal trespass. Following our trial, we were sentenced to three months in federal prison. The SOA Watch began in 1990 to denounce the 1989 School of the America's graduate-led massacre of six Jesuit priests, their cook, and her young daughter at the University of Central America in El Salvador. The SOA renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation in 2001. As a U.S. military training school based in Fort Benning, Georgia, the school made headlines in 1996 when the Pentagon released training manuals used at the school that advocated torture, extortion, and execution. Despite this admission and hundreds of documented human rights and abuses connected to soldiers trained at the school, no independent investigation into the facility has ever taken place. In the early months of 2003, in violation of U.S. sanctions, Kathy brought food and medicine to Iraqi families, and during the bombings of Baghdad, held small children in her arms and sang to them to bring peace and calm in their lives. It was this story that helped me understand the spirit of courageous woman. She has such a gentle, powerful faith that she expresses in her teaching, her writings, her music, and through personal sacrifice. Please welcome Kathy Kelly. Well, thank you, Greg, for that introduction. And um, Peter and colleagues, thank you for welcoming us to be here. And I'm just amazed at what a beautiful library this is. Uh, and thank you to all of you who've come. I want to say a special word of thanks to Peter's students and his 
Um, granddaughters, it's, it's, it's great to see all of you here today. Um, I, I think because of being in a library, I suppose that's partly why I'd like to begin by saying that, um, as Greg mentioned, I had gone over to Iraq um, quite a few times, 27 times, always in open and public violation of the economic sanctions against Iraq. You know, we'd pack our bags with medicines and medical relief supplies and, and tell the United States government we're going again, and, and each time it was considered to be a, a criminal act, but we didn't feel like we were criminals at all. We felt that the imposition of economic sanctions that were, according to the UN, contributing towards the deaths of hundreds of thousands of children, that this was criminal. But then what do we do when we get to Baghdad? Um, we had determined that we would stay, uh, knowing that the 2003 war seemed almost inevitable. So we thought, well, we'll just stay in Baghdad. We, we don't want to you know, wave our blue passports and say it's getting kind of dangerous over here, so we're getting out of here when people had given us so much hospitality. So we were resolved to stay. And one of the things we started to do was visit the English um, department at the Baghdad University, because they could speak English with us, for one thing, and, and it was interesting to get to know the professors and their students. And so at one point, I was sitting down with a group of six graduate students, and I asked them, uh, well, what are you studying? And they said, oh, the poetry of Wilfred Owen. And some of you may know that Wilfred Owen was a poet who died during World War I in the trenches as people were being gassed. And he, before his death, wrote some incredibly moving and um, just brilliant poetry. And so it was a, a time, as I recall, when the women were telling me what they thought about Wilfred Owen's poetry, and I was telling them, what I, and, and we started to tear up. We all had lumps in our throats. And I always wondered, you know, how is it in a dictatorship under Saddam Hussein that the professors were teaching this pacifist poet? And then I learned later, he had a lover. And Wilfred Owen's lover was Siegfried Sassoon. And Siegfried Sassoon was born in Baghdad. <laughs> so that could have been it. But I would just like to Begin then with some of those words from Wilfred Owen. If you could hear, at every jolt, the blood come gargling forth from froth corrupted lungs. Bitten as the vile cut of incurable sores on innocent tongues, obscene as cancer. You would not speak, my friend, with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce e de coromes, pro patria mori. The old lie, sweet and honorable it is, to die for your country. And that was the wisdom of Wilfred Owen, that it's just not true, as he experienced young men dying in the trenches or from having been gassed and in horrible, horrible situations on both sides of that war that it was sweet and honorable for them to die for their country. So I'd like to think about <coughs> war in that kind of light. And um, I'm always happy to come up to Minneapolis-St. Paul to get an invitation from Marie. And Marie invited me to think about coming here in mid-November of last year. But shortly before I came up here, seven weeks after we had sort of settled on a title that would be the, the wounds of war, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen, Marie said, Kathy, will it be okay if we add Iran? Now, isn't that quite something? In seven weeks' time, there was another war for women against military madness to focus on. And this is part of what it means. It's very sad evidence, really, of what it means for us to live in a permanent warfare state. That's a phrase that I've borrowed from Jack Nelson Palmeyer, who's written very eloquently and honestly about it, that we are living in a permanent warfare state. We've got forever wars going on in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and new wars. It's almost like, you know, you're trying to put out brush fires and you think you've stamped one out and then another one starts up again. And so it doesn't lessen our responsibility to try to be aware of what's going on, but it certainly 
makes it important for us to link together because there is so much war making going on. So I, you know, I think it is very, very important for us to think about <coughs> Iran and to recognize that the economic sanctions against Iraq greatly hurt the most vulnerable people. And it was kind of odd, again, under a dictatorship, that even some of Saddam's top people would come to us and say, you know, if you really wanted to get rid of a dictator, and I'm thinking, if you really want to get your head cut off having this conversation, if you really wanted to do it, this is what you do. You would strengthen social services, strengthen the society, and strengthen education. So people, you know, are much more aware of what's going on in their world in many different lights. And then you'd strengthen international ties. But sanctions cut all those things and make it actually easier for the hardliners to dominate. Now, uh, somewhat similar to Iraq, Iran's major source of income has been through oil sales. 70% of the <coughs> revenues for the Iranian government were coming from sale of oil until President Trump very unilaterally said, well, you know what, we're going to rip up that contract and, um, sorry, not contract, that agreement that it took 10, out, 10 years to decide upon. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was an agreement through which the Iranian government, with negotiations between Jawad Zarif and John Kerry said, okay, Iran's no longer going to enrich uranium that could be useful in developing a nuclear weapon. Now that's a lot of patience to work on something for 10 years. And I think it's a lot of patience to work on it when you know that very, very close by, the state of Israel is in fact getting $37 billion from the United States over a span of 10 years to develop all kinds of weaponry, and they have 80 to 85 thermonuclear weapons, and they don't even admit that they have them. There's no International Atomic Energy Association investigating to see what kinds of weapons do the Israelis have. And, you know, the, the Iranians came up with big cement trucks, and they poured cement down the silos into places where they had uranium enrichment going on. That's through. They were told by the International Atomic Energy Association on every single point of the scoreboard, right, you are complying with everything we ask, but somehow Donald Trump, our president, decided, oh, no, 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 we're just walking away from that treaty. So then that meant that they could, the U.S. could impose economic sanctions on Iran, and those sanctions have been brutal. As I mentioned, uh, we're already at war with Iran, I believe, because for 18 months, maybe we haven't surrounded the country with a blockade, but if you cut off people's instruments for financial trade and exchange, you, you might as well have committed an act of aggression and gone to war and blockaded the country. Now, this isn't to say that the hard miners and militarists in Iran should be given a pass or given an excuse, but I do want to note that the government of the United States relies on the Pentagon, which has more weapons sales going on than any other country in the world. In fact, more so than the next eight countries combined. We have 800 bases around the world and 45 bases surrounding Iran. Bases in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Turkey, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and uh, it's very unlikely that the United States is going to want to close down any of those bases. So Iran is kind of <coughs> surrounded by almost like a necklace, like a, like a chokehold. And <coughs> the military budget of Iran is about $15 billion, a little less really than $15 billion. Our Pentagon spends $15 billion within seven days. Our military budget this year is $738 billion. So it would be totally irrational for the Iranian government to say, well, we're going to engage the United States in a conventional, you know, level playing field war. It's just not possible. The Iranians don't have a tiny fraction of the arsenal and the military might that the United States has. Now, I would like to see leaders in Iran say, 
Look, we're taking the military out of our toolkit entirely. We're just not even going to try any military solutions. We're going to work toward diplomacy. We're going to try to restart that joint comprehensive plan of action. We're going to um, do everything we can to build friendships between ourselves and neighboring countries that aren't predicated on weaponry. So that's what I would like. But it doesn't surprise me that the Iranian government and the military, the um, main militarists in Iran, are using what is sometimes called asymmetrical warfare, non-conventional warfare. They're, they're trying to find ways to kind of get at the United States that aren't the ways that countries you know, declare war on each other. And so yes, it could be. Although there's no evidence yet, like with a picture even, that the Iranians are supplying the Houthi rebels with weapons to lob against the Saudis. And the Saudis have been clobbering Yemen, the poorest country in the Arab Peninsula, since 2015 with aerial weapons and with a terrible, terrible blockade. It could be that the Iranians are helping supply Hezbollah in Lebanon. It could be that they're helping to supply Hamas in Gaza with weapons or with money. But that doesn't come even close to what the United States, for instance, is giving to Saudi Arabia to go to war against Yemen. And some see that as a proxy war um, with the Yemenis connected to Iran. Um, when the United States accuses Iran of meddling, meddling in the affairs of other countries, um, I, I think there's some evidence for that. But when the United States meddles in the Middle East, we've invaded and occupied Afghanistan, invaded and occupied Iraq. We've, as I mentioned, created bases and we've got the water spilled with our big, huge destroyers and Navy ships. So our meddlesomeness is, is not something to be overlooked or dismissed. I sometimes think to myself that um, if people in the United States could know the consequences of United States war making of our kind of permanent warfare state as they're experienced by very ordinary people, women and children and farmers and laborers, people who mean us no harm, who might not even know very much about us at all, that the people in the United States would say, no, 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 we don't want to be that way. So I'd, I'd like to share with you tonight three stories that have to do with very simple villages. And they're stories that have been on my mind a great deal lately. And the first one comes from a village in Yemen called Arhad. And Yemen not only has had the, the disaster of aerial bombardments and civil war, in a sense, going on within the country, and a blockade that the Saudis have imposed, but also just the very, very bad luck of drought. Um, and people have not had adequate water to help their livestock stay alive. The livestock start to thirst to death. They're, they, they can't grow plants because they don't have water. They can't have any irrigation. And so um, in this little tiny village of Arhav, people did what seems to me to have been a very sensible thing. They said, look, we've got to try to get water. Let's all chip in, kind of like form a co-op of sorts. And we'll see if we can't get a rig and start digging, and perhaps we'll hit water. So they did. Some people chipped in more than others, but they got a rig set up, and they were drilling, and down, 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 no other water. And people are getting pretty nervous, and they started digging further, and still no water. And then people started to worry, have we been conned? Have we been had? Did somebody you know, cheat us? And so the rig keeps going, and finally one night, they get water. Well, the village of Arhav was one solid celebration. People, uh, they, they sometimes chew a mild stimulant called cut. And so there was plenty of cut chewed that night, and people were dancing and singing and, and just reveling in the fact that they finally gotten what they so desperately needed. And then they were starting to go home, maybe stumbling a little bit, it's pitch black, and all of a sudden the sound of warplane comes equipped with what's called a paveway missile, one of these laser-guided missiles that the United States, in this case, produced in Tucson, Arizona, and that missile hit the partiers. 
And there were 200 tons of, I'm sorry, 200 pounds of TNT explosive that were released immediately. And then shards from the weapon and from other buildings and objects that were hit started to fly at the, they would fly at a thousand miles per hour. And so people were decapitated, they were disemboweled, they were maimed, and many were killed. And so the next morning, people in the village awoke and realized something horrible had happened out there, and some of the people realized their loved ones hadn't returned, so they started to head out toward where they believed this explosion must have been. And you know how little kids are, you can't always restrain them, so some of the kids were running ahead of their parents, and um, people were then trying to find remains of loved ones, and then all of a sudden the warplane came back. And this time it hit, and the bombing continued for an hour and a half. People were driving into cornfields. They were running away as fast as they could to get away from the warplane. And what I believe we need to learn from the people of Arhad is that they were doing what makes sense for all of us to do. They were trying to pool their resources, to put aside their differences, to help everybody get water together. And then they were blessed. More recently, uh, in September, September 17, 2019, in Afghanistan, there uh, was a small area called uh, Wazi Tanzir in the province of Nagarhar, very, very remote. And to me, it was impressive that instead of opting to grow poppy, which is grown all across Afghanistan, this group of people decided, no, we're going to harvest pine nuts. And so they had a forest with pine nut trees and they had organized themselves to um, get laborers, migrant laborers, many of them, some of them children. I don't like child labor, but families are desperate. And the landowners first wrote to both the United States military and a group called ISIL. Islamic State in the Levant, which is kind of like ISIS, but this group is called ISIL, and said, look, please don't attack these laborers. This is the time when they'll begin the harvest. This is when the harvest will end, and um, people will be setting up camp and staying overnight just on the edge of the forest. So we want you to know these are not people that are trying to harm you. They're just trying to harvest the pine nuts. And they hoped that would work. But it didn't work. The United States drone on September 17th, as the workers, exhausted from their day of labor, had put their kettles on over open fires, and they were going to make some tea and something to eat, and then the drone operated where? We don't know. Maybe at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. Maybe at Boat Field in Wisconsin. But this drone, uh, remote control plane carrying missiles, attacked the pine nut harvesters, 40 people were wounded and 32 were killed. And I think about the people wounded, the survivors. And you know, this is way out in the middle of a remote area. There's not a hospital that they could go to easily or a clinic. It's not like those who survived but were wounded would have clean bandages or anesthetics or uh, prostheses if they lost a limb, or surgeons, or doctors, or... No, they just have to somehow survive. And that's what has happened in village after village. This past year, more civilians were killed than any other year in Afghanistan by aerial terrorism. That's what I call the United States air attacks. And so, when you look at yourself, well, how can it be that the United States military, with all its might, with all its equipment, with all its training, would lose, more or less, to ragtag fighters who sometimes don't even have shoes. Well, it's because people begin to say, we've had it with the United States. We'll join the Taliban. During my last trip to Afghanistan in September, I sat down with a young man, his name is Khalid, Muhammad Khalid, 
And he's from the area where the Taliban prevailed. And I was asking him, well, you know, who's part of the Taliban? And he said, well, you know, in our area, it could be your father, it could be your brother. People, if they join the Taliban, can get a motorcycle and get a gun, and they, you know, don't have jobs, they don't have, you know, worthwhile work, and so, you know, the Taliban isn't really considered to be necessarily a big political grouping. It's, it's just more and more people kind of sign up. And with 41% unemployment in a country, I can see it even with my young Afghan peace volunteer friends, you know, they, their brothers or their fathers, their cousins start to sign up with U, the U.S. military sometimes, not because they want to carry a gun and kill people, or, but they're just desperate. So I have one story that I, I think is a good story. Um, and I don't really have a village I can associate it with, but I can tell you that the United States Census Department for all our young students here to keep this in mind, does incredible research and puts it all online. And they research how many weapons the United States sells every year and where they sell them to. I mean, that's how we started to find out about ships that are leaving from the port of Wilmington, Delaware, and the um, port uh, of Baltimore and Maryland, um, and, and exactly what's on the ships, and you can find out what weapons the United States is sending to Saudi Arabia, because the U.S. Census Department tells you everything that's on those ships. It's amazing. Well, I was looking at one of the charts that was about bullets, and I thought, well, this is awful. In 2000, 19, the United States was sending $23 million worth of bullets to Afghanistan. And I thought, well, that's so cruel. Here's a country poised on the brink of civil war. Why send them $23 million worth of bullets? That's awful. But fortunately, I had some time to dig around a little bit more later on. Now, that was on my mind, that statistic, for a long time. What I learned was that in 2016 and 17, there were many documented instances of people who were working for either the Afghan local police or the Afghan national security forces or the Afghan military. And if you're working for one of those groups, you get a gun and you get bullets. But a lot of the soldiers had taken up the habit of going out and shooting their bullets up into the air, not killing anybody, and then collecting the casings and taking them to the local scrap metal dealer and training them in and getting enough money to put food on the table. You know, their, their, their salaries are so meager, but this was a way to augment their salaries, just boom, boom, boom. And I thought, well, that's good, you know, it's better than shoot, shooting somebody because you're a Taliban and boom. But I think in the United States, the thought was, well, that's terrible. We better send them $23 million more bullets. Um, but anyway, I like that idea of the soldiers taking initiative in that way. I also want to tell you another story of villagers, which um, moves me deeply every time I think of it. The first time I ever went to Afghanistan, I went to an Italian hospital called the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War. And I knew about this hospital because they used to run hospitals in Iraq with the same title and the same logo. And people loved those Italian doctors and nurses because they didn't ask any questions. You know, they'd stitch you up if you came because you were a victim of war. And they were so kindly and they didn't charge any money. And Italians were always trying to figure out ways to support these emergency surgical centers. So I went to the one in Kabul. And there I met a nurse a male nurse named Filippo. And Filippo was in the process of packing a backpack that was, I think, the biggest backpack I ever saw. I thought, how is he ever going to carry that? And into the backpack went medicines and vitamins and bandages and all of the things that people in a remote village like the one I described that had been hit so badly, that, that, that they would need. And the idea was that the emergency hospital ambulance would drive Filippo as far as a road existed. And then he'd get out with his big backpack and trek up the mountainside until he reached a village and then he could distribute a clinic's worth of supplies, which would last a very long time. They were so precious, people wouldn't waste them. And he told me that he then uh, would go back to Italy. He had done six months and now he's, he's off and he's going back to Italy, right? And he said that the last time 
he visited the area and then was going to leave, and um, you know, his six months is over. He said, villagers from the surrounding area had walked for four hours in the snow just to be able to come and form a circle and say goodbye. Aww. And he said to me, hello, yeah, I fall in love that day. <laughs> he fell in love with the villagers. And, and that's what could be true for the United States. You know, at the height of the surge under President Obama, when there were um, many, many, many thousands more United States soldiers in Afghanistan, until the time when those soldiers shrank back to their number now, which is about 8,000, the cost to keep one soldier, one U.S. soldier, in Afghanistan for one year, believe it or not, was $2 million. $2 million per soldier per year. And that's factoring in all the costs for what was considered to be the world's largest retrograde mission ever in history. When you take apart a military, it costs a lot of money. And um, so I was again over at that emergency hospital, and I told them that statistic. And they kind of laughed, and they said, ah, oh, you, you, suppose you send three more of your soldiers home, and you just say bye-bye, well, and you give us six million dollars, what we do with it. <laughs> you know, we could be so beloved if we were putting our resources and our, our know-how and our incredible inventiveness into creating things that are good for people and sharing resources with other people. We could be very, very well loved. So that makes me think that we should do a little pushback in a way. Anytime, even if it's just in your own head, anytime somebody says Department of Defense, because it's not a Department of Defense, it's not defending. The Pentagon is not defending our security, not defending a better way of life. I mean, when you think about what's defended through the so-called Department of Defense, it's the very, very extraordinary high budgets of Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics. I mean, just the mention of having killed General Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general who was recently assassinated by a US drone, just the mention of possible war with Iran caused a 7% increase in the stocks of the major officers of those companies I just mentioned. Because they get paid sometimes in stocks, in shares in the company. And so when it looks like a war might come about, then the stocks go up, 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 and their packets get filled more and more. And um, the person who's with the company, uh, General Atomics, that made the drone that killed General Qasem Soleimani, his name is Neil Blue, he's worth $4.1 billion. Now even as I say that, I mean, I, I know no person no person's worth can be measured in dollars, I get that. But, but anyway, that's the statistic. That there's just phenomenal wealth invested in these so-called defense contractors. But then I want to say, they're not defense contractors. That's not wherein we will find security. And in, in the history books, um, I learned this from reading a book called What I Learned in High School That Wasn't Really True. <laughs> it's a website. Uh, the United States did call the Military Bureau, the Department of War, up until 1946. But then the United Nations came up with a charter that said that war could only ever be justified if it was, if it is, a war of self-defense. So the generals in this Department of War said, um, let's change our name to the Department of Defense. And that's when it became the DOD, Department of Defense. But it really is, I think, more aptly named the Department of Military Imperial Aggression, or you know, some kind of a name that would communicate what is really done through the Pentagon. Um, I do want to tell one other story about a village that comes from USA Today, which kind of surprised me. It, it took that newspaper 10 years to tell this story. And it's um, a story that begins in a village called Azizabad. And there is a remote village in Afghanistan. Um, they wanted to build an extension to an airport that the United States military was using near the village of Azizabad. 
and they needed workers to build the extension, but then they also needed security people to protect the workers because that's just the kind of site that others might want to, to blow up. Well, um, I get the problems that are inherent if you are trying to figure out how are you going to pay the workers. It's not like in a remote area with small villages and no banking system to speak of and people don't have checks and, uh, well, how do you get the money to each individual worker? So the United States hired a contracting company called Armor Group, and um, we sometimes call them security contractors, and they found two Afghan people that they were pretty sure would be able to get workers assembled and would take care of some of these logistics problems. And so that was, that was done. And it happened that the two men were best friends. Um, for convenience purposes, the United States military called the two men, Mr. Pink and Mr. White. They, they didn't even bother to try to use their real names. Well, Mr. Pink and Mr. White each got a load of weapons to pass out to the people they had hired. They got lots of cash to pay all these people, and they got uh, vehicles, quite a few vehicles, to drive people around. And so each one of them was doing quite well. But as sometimes happens when people get greedy and fearful, they, even though they had been best friends, started looking at each other and thinking, hmm, you know, one person could be in charge of this whole operation and take all the guns and all the money and all the vehicles, and it could be me and not you, so one of them killed the other. And then that, of course, started the cycles of revenge because, uh, you know, there's Mr. Pink and Mr. White and one of them is dead, so the other now is going to want to retaliate. And the retaliatory scheming went on, but the United States didn't withdraw from it. They kept with the person they'd initially hired. And then that person had worked out what turned out to be quite a scheme, telling the U.S. military, I can bring to you the top Taliban general in this area. I can tell you exactly where he'll be and give you the signal and you can attack and kill him. Now there's somebody that people my age and up in this room would remember named Oliver North. <laughs> and a lot of us remember him as somebody who, you know, did some pretty criminal things because he was involved in the Iran Contra scandal. And anyway, he's now um, an advisor for Fox News and Oliver North is out there in the middle of nowhere near Azizabad with the cameras ready to roll and he's going to do a big Fox News special about the United States killing this Taliban general in Azizabad. Well, it was a total catastrophe because what nobody told apparently the U.S. higher-ups who were planning this is that the reason the general from the Taliban would be in the area was because there was a one-year memorial of somebody who had been killed a year ago. And it's typical in Afghan society that the following year, people come together. So people would come together in their finest clothing and with their children and with food, and they would prepare big meals, and they would then, you know, all get, be gathered and talk together into the middle of the night. And so when the United States started to bomb that compound where they thought they were hitting the Taliban and other Taliban fighters, they were hitting women and children. 91 people were killed, 60 of them were children. Oliver North filmed it, declared it a success because he never bothered to hang around long enough to find out what really happened. And it took USA Today from 2008 until a few weeks ago to finally get the information declassified and get the names of all the people who've been killed in Azizabad that night and then the photos of the people who were rioting the next day, people who've been working for the United States, showing their ID badges, furious that this could happen. And these are the kinds of village stories that are told in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in places where the United States is meddling and going to war. And I believe these are the kinds of stories that would be told also in Iran if we go to war against Iran. And so I think about those women in the very serene and lovely library where we sat at a table and we read Wilfred Owen's poetry together. And I think about 
Wilfred Owen, who at the end of one of his poems likened the war makers in World War I to a biblical figure, Father Abraham. And Father Abraham, in this biblical story, believes that the great God wants him to send his son out to gather firewood and then bind the son and tie, you know, tie him up and put him over the firewood and then plunge a dagger into him, kill him, and offer his son a sacrifice to the God. And in the Genesis story, fortunately for the son, his name is Isaac, uh, an angel, the angel of the Lord appears and says, hey, cut it out and stop, 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 and the great God doesn't want this. So um, Isaac can kind of skip down the mountainside. But in the way that Wilfred Owen writes that poem, that story into his poem, he writes that uh, the sun is part of the parapets and trenches. Well, there aren't any parapets and trenches in the book of Genesis and this old biblical story, so you get the idea. It's the war that he's referring to, and the sons are the young men who are forced out to the trenches to fight in that war. And um, the Father Abraham figure is just called the old man. And the old man is ready to plunge the dagger into the sun. And in Wilfred Owen's poem, he writes, But the angel of the Lord said, Lay not thy hand upon the sun. Offer the realm of pride instead. But the old man would not so, and slew the son, and half the seed of Europe, one by one. The old man would not so. He wouldn't offer the ram of pride instead. And so I get this, I, I keep asking myself, well, what is that ram of pride that we, with our $738 billion military budget and our readiness to slaughter and kill, in villages and places all over the world. What is that realm of pride? And I think it's somehow this pride that we have that, well, yeah, 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 that all, that all might be true, but we still are the freedom bringers. We are the gift givers. We are the superior society. We're still really, like, we're it. <laughs> we're number one. And that's why I know it's so important to try to look in the mirror and see ourselves not as number one, but as people who have everything to learn from the villagers, the very ordinary and simple people in other parts of the world. In Iraq today, by the thousands, maybe even by the millions, they're telling us, go, go. You know, it, it's almost like, what part of go home don't we understand? Um, and, and I think that there are messages coming. We're 6% of the world's population. The other 94% of the world has many, many people who are looking for radical, revolutionary change. Radical and revolutionary change. Changes in the way we live, live our lives, changes in the risks we're willing to take, all of us, to keep this planet going. Greta Thunberg is certainly, you know, a radical revolutionary from whom we have much to learn. And it gives great, great, great hope. So I want to thank all of you for listening to me go on and on and on. I've lost my off switch as I get older. I, <laughs> but when I was really little, um, I remember um, my neighbors and aunts were telling my mother, you've got to take her in. You know, she doesn't talk. There's something wrong with her. <laughs> and so my mother was kind of dragging her feet and didn't take me to get checked out. And then as she told it to me, she said, I want you to start to talk and you never stopped and it was very hard for me because I was home with you all alone. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, it is time to um, get a chance to hear from Marie. Uh, we have in Marie Braun one of the strongest and most kindly and wise peace activists in the United States. <laughs> we, we met each other on a bus in Iraq, but it's been wonderful to know her since. <laughs> So I'll sit down for a bit and hear from you. Well, Kathy's been doing a lot of work. Uh, actually, on Monday, she was over at um, St. John's for an every church, peace church event. Then we sent her off to Mankato, and then to Brainerd, and then to Grand Rapids. She's here tonight. <laughs> 
and tomorrow she's going to Red Wing. So um, obviously she's very popular in Minnesota. I make these calls and people say yes, and I can get her all lined up in one week, which is kind of a miracle, you know, that people just say, well, we'll do it the week she's here. <laughs> you know, Sammy Rosilli comes for two months, and he's kind of all spread out. It's actually easier to do it this way, and I thank you for that. <laughs> anyway, I'm from Women Against Military Madness, and Women Against Military Madness on the Twin Cities campaign organized Kathy's tour uh, this time. Um, and I just want to say a few things about WAM. WAM does many, many things. We have several committees. I will speak to most about the UNWAR committee because that's the one I facilitate. Uh, we are working on a campaign to ban nuclear weapons. Some of you may know about that, and I, I have given you a recent um, action alert that we handed out. Plus, you have some of those stickers. And I can give you students or anyone else a big thing of stickers that you can take back to your school and get to all your friends. And you can, I've got some extra action alerts that you can take. Um, and um, anyway, the other thing I'm doing with this is we are, not I, we're sending out letters to about 40 churches asking them to have an event this year because this year, 2020, marks the 50th anniversary of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is the treaty that Kathy took. Did you mention that one? No, I didn't mention okay. that one. I mentioned it. But this is when the U.S. agreed that they would give up all our nuclear, I mean, all the nuclear nations, said they would get rid of their nuclear nations, and all the non-nuclear nations said that they would not have nuclear weapons. So this was an agreement made. Well, the non-nuclear weapons I mean, the countries have not gotten nuclear weapons, but the nuclear nations have not given up their nukes. There are nine nuclear nations now. So we are very fortunate in the last couple of years to have an agreement in Alpha Treaty. It started out as an agreement of 20, in 2017 uh, that the nations came together and said, we want a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And on July, I think it was July 17th of two, actually it was in 2016, I think, 2016, 19, 2016, yeah, that they talked about getting together. Um, then in uh, 2017, they did get together and 122 nations agreed on a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. It's called the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The United States said, when they, got, when they agreed on that, we will not sign it. We will never be a party to this. And of course, the United States has the most power to bring the nine nuclear nations together. And so we are calling on the United States, um, and particularly the United States, because that's our country, to try to bring the nine nuclear nations together to figure out a way that they can get rid of their nuclear weapons. I mean, we understand that the US is not going to do it alone. They, they, will, they will need to do it in coalition with the other nuclear nations. They don't have to, but they won't do it otherwise. Uh, so that's one of the things we're doing, and we are asking you in this action alert to call your senators, ask them to support the treaty, and to ask that our uh, government to work on getting the nine nuclear nations together. So that's the two asks that we have of our senators. Um, and we are asking the churches to do an event in their community. And we would like schools and universities. They're probably the next ones who will reach out to the colleges, universities, and high schools, too, to have an event uh, about the treaty and about what we hope the United States would do. So some of these students may want to think about uh, getting a group together in your school. Call them, you know, and, and we can set that up. Uh, so. What else are we doing, Carol, on the Anwar Committee? <laughs> uh, but besides the Anwar Committee, we have many other events. And if I missed some, Carol, maybe you can check back there for some flyers. Um, we are make, we are doing Making the Connections, Climate Change, and U.S. Militarism on Saturday, February 29th. There's some flyers back there. It's at 4200 Cedar, which is where the WAM office is located. And uh, we like to show the connections between climate change and the U.S. military because U.S. military is one of the biggest users 
uh, uh, you know, causing a lot of problems, a lot of fuel. You can imagine with these planes that we're uh, using and everything, we use an awful lot of fuel and contribute greatly to the climate crisis that we now have. So that should be a very interesting talk. We also have a committee on Latin America, and uh, once a month we have a um, morning event, and the next one is Saturday, February 15th, 2020. It's at 9.30 uh, to noon. It's at 4200 Cedar again, that's the WAM office. And it's focused on Chile. This should be very good. Michael Livingston is the speaker. He's a professor at the College of St. Benedict and St. John University in St. Cloud, or St. Joseph actually. And uh, he's been to Chile several times, spent like six months there at a time. So this should be a wonderful talk. Uh, Carol, do we have some other things back there? I think we have something on Palestine and Cuba. Yeah, well, we're showing the same film that they're going to be showing here, that we're showing the film on Gaza um, next Saturday, February 8th in the morning. And um, the Eastside Freedom Library is going to show up the week later on the 15th, I believe. So if you can, if you can get to one or the other, I, it's a very good film. Very good to see. Okay, thank you. Do you have an announcement? Well, Mary, maybe you or I could mention the success that that's your piece and you folks, Steve McEwen and others have had going around on the petitions, getting over 25,000 signatures, and every one of the 851 towns in Minnesota getting Republicans and Democrats to sign. People are against the nuclear weapons, yeah, is the point. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, the campaign uh, started a petition drive uh, three years ago to ban nuclear weapons, and we said we get 5,000 signatures. Well, uh, Steve McEwen from Veterans for Peace said, oh, we can do better than that. He is the number one petition signature getter in the United States of America. Uh, anyway, he said, uh, we're going to get 10,000, I think was the first goal. Then he said, no, we're going to get 20,000. <laughs> Well, and we're going to get every town and city in the state of Minnesota. We're going to get at least one person in every town and city. Well, Steve and a couple of other vets have driven all over the state in their Veterans for Peace bus. We now have 23,000 signatures from all 851 towns and cities wow. in the state of Minnesota. So this has been a lot of hard work, but good work. And you will notice in that alert that I gave you, this is why we want you to call your senators. Because when we brought our things to the Senate, well, we didn't actually get to see them or our reps. This is addressed to our 10 congressional representatives, which is our two congressmen and our eight House people at the federal level. And um, we went to see them after we collected 8,000 signatures. We didn't get to see any of the real people. <laughs> The staffs are real people, of course, and they're wonderful. We did get to see the staffs. And we said, this time, we feel we have collected so many signatures. We should get to see our senators, and we should get to see our representatives. I don't know what, whether that's going to happen, but one of the things they said to us is, nobody's calling us about nuclear weapons. We don't, we don't hear anything. So that's why we have this action alert. We gave about 400 of these at St. Joan of Arc Church. Uh, sometime in December, and if you want to get some out of the church that you belong to or your school, just call WAM, we'll send you a whole bunch of these alerts, and see if we can't get someone calling our senators, telling them, yes, we are concerned about nuclear weapons. It's just not those people that are bringing in those petitions. So, anyway, if you would do that, I and WAM, and all the anti-nuclear people would greatly really appreciate it. Uh, you know, there's people all over the world working on this, so, yes. Okay, well, uh, any other, does anybody else have an announcement? I usually ask people if they have announcements. Okay, great. Oh, one more. Uh, Why don't you Rat stand up, right? because it's kind of hard to hear. <clears throat> Peter Ratcliffe has already a stash of uh, Korean quarterly uh, newspapers that oh, comes yeah. out four times a year. And the new issue which just came out. I'm a Korean War veteran, so that's one reason why I'm mentioning this. Uh, has uh, the usual excellent articles, which gives you the news that you don't see in our city newspapers about what's really going on in Korea, including North Korea, the relationships and all that. That's in the main section. The second section, front page, 
is this issue about the behavior of American troops since 1950, when we first went there, on sexual and other violent matters, um, which is still going on, expanding, and you and I, those who pay taxes, are paying for this. Thousands and thousands of prostitutes get checks every month from us. Uh, and it just goes on and on. And I was over there in 95 and went around and saw our ambassador, et cetera, trying to stop this. It's only gotten worse. Uh, it's just beyond belief. And it's organized by our military and the South Korean military. So uh, there's some bad stuff going on, and you ought to read about it. It's five pages long. You'll get more than you want. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, OK, well, I want to I I want to say a couple other things. I want to encourage you to become WAM members if you're so inclined. Uh, you'll get a wonderful newsletter. And you can take it to your school. And we'll send you several copies for your school if your school is interested. And I want to say that Carla really is live streaming this right now. And she live streamed the event on Monday at St. John Park. And you can pick that up on YouTube. So if you have some friends that you think might like to hear Kathy, uh, check it on YouTube and tell them how to get on YouTube so they can hear it too. So thank you, Carla, for doing that. It's uh, honestly a great service that you do. So now I want to say a couple of words about Kathy. I mean, you've heard a lot about her in the introduction. But of course, Kathy has to make some money when she makes these trips. She's got to pay for her trip. She's um, her food and whatever. Well, usually we try to take care of you while you're here. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's expensive to do what Kathy does. She travels, like she said, she traveled to Iraq 27 times. She's been to Afghanistan, who knows how many times, many, many times. And her organization also supports the Peace uh, Volunteer Group in, Africa, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, which started out as a group of young Peace Volunteers from different parts of the country you know, groups that didn't know each other, didn't necessarily get along, and have come, have come to live together to show that they could work together and live together and promote peace. And Kathy has made many trips over there, spent long periods of time with them, helping them and supporting them, and then paying their rent. So uh, her group pays for their rent, which is also, you know, expensive. They have a staff that they have, uh, a small staff, but still a staff that needs to be paid. Mm -hmm. I think they make minimum wage. <laughs> As do volunteers for most peace groups, uh, or I mean staff for most peace groups. Uh, but also they have a, wonder, a lot of wonderful programs going on. So we ask people to be very generous in your uh, donation. And um, checks can be made out to Kathy Kelly, right? Or VCNB. VCNB, nonviolent. Voices for Creative Nonviolence. Voices for Creative Nonviolence, I know that. <laughs> okay, so someone's going to pass the basket. This is our library hat. We'll start it over here. Uh, actually, I was supposed to do that first so that you could write your test while I was making the announcements, but I kind of got things mixed up. Is there, uh, well, I think while we're taking the collection, we can begin the question now. And also, I have a small brother that lives with a residence over there. We can yeah. Have a yeah. Actually, Kathy, I was going to say, Kathy has a lot of literature back there. By the way, they put out <coughs> these wonderful <coughs> newsletters. So if you sign up, you can get the newsletter. That's a job. You just have to give them your email. And I think if you don't have email, you can give them snail mail. Uh, so what are, you know, maybe when you go out, you can look at the literature and see what's available. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, I, um, I have this booklet called Nuclear Weapons or Us, and it um, pertains to the treaty that Marie was speaking of. So um, please feel free. I, I don't have one for everybody, but um, we, we have this many. <laughs> And please feel free to take one of these on your way out. This one I have to sell. Our friend Maya Evans um, in the United Kingdom uh, put together this book. She and I have been to, in Afghanistan together many, many times. And she's in her 30s and has loads of energy for taking pictures. And so Maya put pictures and text together, and I've done some of the writing. But we, we have to sell this one. So this is $10, but feel free. Um, I'll just put these back. <coughs> Thank you. 
and certainly if anybody has any questions, um, comments, objections, uh, suggestions, that it, it would be great to hear from any one of you. I know the, it's a Friday night and some of you may be wanting to have a little bit of rest time and call it a weekend, but um, it's now 8 o'clock. Peter, do you have advice for us about what time things wrap up? Another half hour is fine, Kathy, if you want. Oh, okay. So um, please feel free to speak up if there's anything you'd like to ask or comment. Thank you. Well, for me, I've heard you several times, and it was through you that I got involved with supporting the Afghan Peace Volunteers. Aaron and Sims. subsequently, um, Kara Lozier's <coughs> program, Roya, which supports, allows people in various parts of the world to support at very low cost the education of kids who would be impoverished and otherwise unable to go to school. And so, um, you know, for the cost of a coffee out, you know, I can put a child into school for a month and exchange letters with that student. Through Roya, then, I found out about the, um, the Rahila Foundation that about a year, I think a year and a half ago now, there was a bombing in Kabul that one of the many people who was killed, many girls who were going to take their university uh, entrance exams, one was a young woman named Rahila. And her <coughs> brother, in response to this, began a foundation to help other students uh, learn. Their library looks like this. It's full of books. It's full of students who are striving for something better. And no matter what the news has to say, and you know, heaven knows your, your examples of all the destruction that happens, um, the thing that gets me through all that is these connections to very optimistic, energized young people who want peace, who, who want to create a better, in this case, Afghanistan. Um, keeps me going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so wherever you go to talk, talk more about you know the peace volunteers or the 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 wonderful things that they are doing to pull themselves out of this mire. Mm -hmm. And no matter how destructive we have been to them, they don't seem to blame us. They're glad to reach out to individual people in the United States. They recognize that we are not our government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, it gets uh, very cold in Afghanistan during the winter. And um, most people don't have electricity, but very often the electricity goes out for those that do have it. So my young friends in the Afghan Peace Fellowships have learned everything they can figure out about solar heating. And one thing that they've done is now begin to um, teach families how to use solar-powered batteries and install them. And they say, we'll pick up half the cost. You know, if you'll pay for half of it, we'll pay for the other half. And it, it's, I mean, I, it's a big difference for me when I go over there. <laughs> when the lights go out, you're not stuck, you know, trying to find your way around, and you, you do have um, the solar energy, and that's been very, very, very good. The other thing that they've been doing is, um, in, they have a school for kids who otherwise I mean, it's, it's not only wouldn't learn, but sometimes get pulled into gangs and prostitution rings and terrible things. And so for these little kids, they try to help them learn their alphabet, learn their math. But they, they also take a nonviolence class once a week, which is very, very good. And uh, they've graduated um, one group of 100 that went through three years of the school, and now they're working on their next group. But um, one thing they ask the families to do is to um, pick one person from the family who's maybe over 12 or 13, well, over 13 years of age, who will learn a skill. 
and then they make it possible for that person to get some vocational training. Sometimes the skill has to do with um, taking apart cell phones and recycling or, or repairing cell phones, and sometimes it's cobbling. They've got a little cobbling industry going, and, and then they, um, they've learned how to make jackets, and then they give those jackets to each of the street kids. So, so those, uh, thank you, it, it is really important to tell about those things. And then, uh, as I've often said, some of the most important surveillance in Kabul today is not accomplished by the big blimps that are constantly flying over the city with their cameras, you know, picking up film footage. It's accomplished by these young teenagers who go all the way up the mountainside. You know, there's no road and it's icy, and they sit down with widows and families that don't have an income, and they ask questions. Their survey asks, how often every week do you get beans? I mean, nobody gets meat. Uh, what's your source for water? Who earns an income? And how old is that person? And if that question is answered, well, the eight-year-old, or the six, then that survey goes to the top of the deck. And then they come back down the mountain, and they sit on the floor with their surveys, and it's not easy. You know, it's kind of heartbreaking, really, because they try to figure out who should be invited to send a child to the street kids school and who could be invited to be part of the tailoring effort. And so that's how they um, make those decisions based on needed surveys. And again, you know, the United States could be so beloved if we were in sync with those kinds of activities and not inside our bases and with our protection and you know, protected by people with just in their shirt sleeves that are supposed to be holding their guns. And, you know, we, 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 we don't have to be this way. Thank you. Um, what started your travels and, like, volunteering in the Middle East? Hmm. Well, you had before you an ex-con. Yeah. <laughs> I went to prison for planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. Oh. <laughs> and I got a year in prison for that. <laughs> so while I was in prison, the only way I can explain it is that, um, I mean, it was the most educational year of my life since I was five and I learned how to read. I was learning all the time, but I also got a little more backbone. That's the only way I can explain it. And so when I got out of prison, I heard about a group of people, this was way back in 1991, 1990 actually, who were going to go over to the country of Iraq because it looked like the United States was going to go to war against Iraq. And it seemed to me, you know, um, the United States had just um, overthrown somebody else's government, and so it couldn't be that the United States, you know, didn't like um, invasion of another country. We were invading other countries, and Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Um, uh, Iraq had a, a very brutal dictator, Saddam Hussein, but the United States had been supporting brutal dictators all around the world. So I thought, I think this war has got more to do with oil and control of resources. And so I thought, well, I could join that team. And then I, I applied and I didn't hear anything and my nose was out of joint. I thought, well, what do you have to do to get in with this crowd? I mean, I did a year in prison. <laughs> um, so then I was accepted and I went over um, and everything was new. It was all a very, very upward learning curve for me. But that began to help me understand that, you know, soldiers aren't asked, um, is this a good time for you to go, or do your wife and kids want you to do this? They, you know, if they get the orders, they go. And we in the peace movement, you know, we could decide, well, do I want to do this, or don't I? And, and we just expect the soldiers are supposed to go risk their lives and maybe come back and never be quite the same again. Um, but we, we don't expect as much of people in the peace movement. And so I kind of wanted to you know, suggest to myself and along with others that maybe we could up what we were willing to risk on behalf of peace. So I think that's kind of what got me started. I met some of the most interesting people in the world. Um, some people were really nuts. <laughs> it was a very unusual peace team, let me tell you. <laughs> but um, I, I would run down the street to meet any one of them again. And I, I think um, it's kind of like Felipe, the nurse I told you about, when he said I fell in love. That's what I think happens. You just you fall in love with people. And, and then it, it makes it a lot more um, sensible 
to, to do these kinds of things. But I do think things are changing, and again, Greta Thunberg coming over here on that boat with no fuel. Um, I haven't traveled around on planes with no fuel, so I, we have to go back to the drawing board and think about how to stay in touch. And I so admire that you're able to stay in touch as beautifully as you do through correspondence, and um, I think Skype and Zoom and all that has a place too, although I'll miss that opportunity for people to come together face to face. But I think, um, you know, we have to find ways to change how we understand travel. Thank you for that question. Marie? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, why do you think the U.S. doesn't have a better strategy for getting along with people? Uh, like you say, they'd be beloved if they would do these things. Maybe you can explain mm -hmm. why. <coughs> what you understand, what you don't. Well, I think the United States has for a very long time wanted to see itself as number one. Yeah. You know, that we are the premier country and um, that we should be able to control other people's resources. So, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's part of the way that our country was begun. You know, it's very good for me to be up here in Minnesota and I can't pronounce any of the names, but to know this is named after a tribe, and this is named after a tribe, and, and that remembrance that this land was not our land. You know, it was taken from people who lived here first. Um, and, and I think that there, it, it, it just has persisted through our history, um, both a readiness to say that we ought to be number one, but then also, you know, just this constant uh, availability of enormous arsenals of weapons. Uh, I mean, is, isn't it kind of amazing? The next eight weapon-producing countries combined don't have as much as we have. So that's our top crop. It's what we make. And anytime people have these weapons, they start itching to use them. And so that's also, you know, hey, if we, it's kind of like Mr. Pink and Mr. White that I told you about. You know, they've each got, you know, quite a stash. And then they think, oh, well, you know, actually, and, and there's that temptation to make land grabs and to engage in plunder. And it doesn't bring back good things uh, or good results for the United States. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, we have this very, very sad and tragic statistic that every single day, 22 combat veterans commit suicide. 22 every day in the United States. And, you know, all of us who have people in our families, maybe our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, who were part of wars or displacement, became refugees because of wars, that trauma doesn't just go away, you know, when somebody says, oh, that war is over. Those traumas persist for a long time and have odd ways sometimes of manifesting. But um, war isn't over when it's over. So it's a very um, big thing to begin to put another country in the crosshairs of our potential aim for another war. And, and we should, I think all of us, I know I need to keep learning about Iran. I need to learn a lot about Iran. And of course, we, you know, we shouldn't just say, oh, well, everybody running around as a nice person. And that's probably not true. <laughs> but we have no right to go in and start yet another war in that part of the world. Well, happy weekend. Huh? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>